Welcome back to Discipleship Training. We are going to continue um, the series on the on God's framework of discipleship and pick up where we left off uh, at the beginning of May. So we've been talking about godly intimacy and we had just started talking about prayer as a form of communication with God, but also as intimacy with God, right? Any good relationship has a strong foundation of consistent, sincere communication. So I'm going to kind of start that over. I won't uh, probably won't read, um, go through all of the scriptures we went through um, when we started it, uh, but just so we can um, recap what we've already covered before then moving into the material, uh, the new material that we hadn't covered. So prayer as a definition, it is our direct means of verbal communication with Jesus. It should be open and consistent as that is a foundational piece of our relationship with the Lord. Right. Oftentimes we look at prayer as a means to make requests of the Lord. What we're going to see as we begin to operate through scripture is Jesus's desire is that prayer is far. It moves beyond uh, transactional, right? Where we we tell him what our problems are. We tell him what we want to him to fix. We tell him the desires of our heart. What he really desires is a two way street of communication. He cares about all of those things. He, as we talked about earlier when we were viewing intimacy and that deep bond that the Lord wants to form with us. He cares about our thoughts, our feelings, our day to day, what we have going on, the desires of our heart, the frustrations that we have on a given day, the problems that we are experiencing. But he also cares about edifying us and building us up and also listening to him from a, a parental standpoint of discipline, of rebuke, of correction and education. So in order to have that type of communication, it has to be a two way street. We have to listen probably the probably even more than we speak. Right. There's an old saying that that's the reason we were given two ears and one mouth. So you would hear twice as much as you speak. All right. So let's go to. We're going to go to where I want to start. We're going to go to Psalm 145, verse 18 in the Amplified Classic Edition. So in the Amplified Classic Edition, we are turning to Psalm 145, verse 18. And it reads, the Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him sincerely and in truth. So it goes back to that open, sincere, consistent communication. He has a reciprocative relationship with those who call on him, who request of him, who pray to him in sincerity and in truth, meaning the truth of his word, what you are asking for is in his will. What you need from him is within the framework and the parameters in the prescribed ways God has designed. There's a scripture that says you, you oh, sorry, go ahead. There was a question. Uh, I was going to ask, can you um, increase your font size? Yep. Thanks. That good? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me zoom in just a little bit. There we go. Okay. So we have to make sure that when we're talking about prayer, right, and that, that direct communication, it is verbal, right? And we're not talking about praying mentally. This is verbal communication with the Lord, is that we are operating in sincerity and we are operating within the truth of God's word. We're not just praying and saying and communicating and asking and requesting things that are contrary to the word of God. All right, so let's go to Jeremiah chapter 33, verse three, and we're going to read this in the New King James Version. So in the New King James Version, once again, that is Jeremiah chapter 33, verse three. Call to me and I will answer you 
and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. So once again, going into that communication with the Lord, it builds out. It's more than transaction, right? It's more than vent sessions. It's more than just here's going on with my day to day. It is a means of education, of edification, of building up, of rebuke, of correction. We have to make sure that we are in a position to be able to receive that. Tremiko talks about it all the time when, we, when in our prayer. It's not just about us speaking to the Lord. It's also about listening for that response. And then within the body of Christ as disciples, that is our biggest hurdle right now when it comes to our prayer life. We, we speak, we speak, we speak, we speak, we speak, but we don't have the patience to be consistent in making sure, am I taking the time to actually listen for a response? And not just any response, right? Not just the response I want, but sometimes the Lord is going to say no. Sometimes the Lord is going to come back with the answer that we don't want. So we have to make sure, just like with any of our human to human relationships, right? It's about that sincere communication. If I am in a relationship in the person that I'm speaking with and, and talking to on a daily basis, if they're only telling me things that I want to hear, right? If they're always on my side, if there's never any correction, if there's never any building up or edification in the sense that, you know what, sometimes you're wrong, person's not a really good friend, right? It feels good in the short term, but in the long term, it is not going to be good for your personal development. All right, let's look at one more. And so and we're going to stay in the New King James Version. So staying in the New King James Version, we are going to go to Hosea chapter 14, verse 1 through 2. Once again, that's in the New King James Version. We are in Hosea chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled... Because of your iniquity, take words with you in return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. So wanted to review this scripture. So one, we can see that when we're talking about praying, when we're talking about going to God, it is verbal. You are taking words with you. That's number one. Number two, showing the different aspects, right? Like I said, it is more than just transactional. It's more than just our desires. Our communication with Jesus is key to our forgiveness of sin. We have to go confess our sins to him. We have to go and ask him for forgiveness. It's not just given to us anytime we make a sin, anytime we commit a sin and we don't communicate that with the Lord, right? So all of these aspects of prayer is about building our relationship with him. And that is why it is a part of intimacy. It's because going back to what we read in Psalm 145, verse 18 in the Amplified Classic Edition, it is about that sincerity. It is about that truth. So that, um, in a nutshell, is looking at prayer as a form of intimacy. So we're going to go into the next session, a next section from a recap perspective, and then we we'll probably um, we'll get into some of the new material. So, any questions there before I go to the next piece? All righty. So, as disciples, the effectiveness of our prayer. Sorry, is- <laughs> we're trying to make um, I was talking, but it was on mute. Um, when you open a Bible gateway, you're going to have to always click the X at that, that bottom window because it's showing and it's... Okay. Got it. Okay, thanks. All right. As disciples, the effectiveness of our prayer is predicated on the status of our relationship with Jesus. So what does that mean? Are we praying while operating in righteousness or operating in sin? Because that affects how well we as disciples can get a message through to Jesus, 
to intercede on behalf of others, get clarity of understanding, clarity of direction. It is predicated on where we currently sit in our relationship with the Lord. We're going to review a number of scriptures um, so we can build this out and you can see this uh, and then we'll um, get into some of the new material. So let's go to 1 Peter. We're going to stay in the New King James Version. So in the New King James Version, we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. So in the New King James Version, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. So what we're already starting off with is an understanding that we are moving towards the end game, right? That we are moving towards what we have read, what has been revealed to us in Revelation, the end times. We are moving towards the Antichrist. We are moving towards people leaving the body of Christ. All of the things that have been prophesied that are going to occur we see here in this writing, Peter's saying we, we are already here. And because of that, there is a seriousness that we as disciples have to take when it comes to our prayers. There is a diligent behavior we have to take in terms of being watchful, paying attention to what's going on, making sure that we are in a position both to communicate from our end to the Lord, as I said earlier, right? Getting a prayer through, being able to intercede, but also in a position to be receptive into what the direction is, what the missing piece of information is, what the strategy is coming from Jesus of how we should be operating, how we should be executing. So starting off, we already see it is, it is a serious approach we must take to our prayer life when um, communicating with Jesus as disciples. Okay, so now let's we're going to stay in the New King James Version, and we are going to read Isaiah chapter fifty nine, verse two. So in the New King James Version, we are reading Isaiah chapter fifty nine. Verse 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Now, we're going to talk about, as a classification, we're going to talk about the sinner's perspective when it comes to prayer. But right now we're focusing on on our perspective as disciples, right? So being born again saints, what does that mean as a classification? That we have repented, that we have been born, that we have been fully baptized, baptized, fully submerged in water in Jesus' name, that we have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, meaning that we've been filled with the Holy Spirit with the sign of speaking in other tongues. We are... Tying this back to the context of scripture. We are the spiritual nation of Israel, right? So we can, we can see the similarities here. So Israel, as the chosen people of God, as the nation of God, as in operating in the word of God, they are being told by the prophet Isaiah, the Lord has separated himself from you because you are operating in iniquity, a lifestyle of sin. In the, the sinful actions that you continue to take, the sinful behaviors that you continue to operate in, has hidden his face from you. There is a block because there is a separation between God and sin. They cannot commingle. They cannot exist together. So your prayers, Israel, are no longer being heard. Your requests are no longer being answered because of your lifestyle of sin has separated from you. So as disciples, we can fall into the same situation. That's why I said your relationship status. Are you operating in 
righteousness or are you operating in sin will dictate Jesus's position towards us as disciples communicating with him through prayer. If you are operating in a sinful lifestyle, if you are consistent in sinful behaviors, you cannot get a prayer through. You cannot intercede for anyone. You are an ineffective disciple. Why? Because as disciples, we are the mouthpiece and the ambassadors of Jesus. Our direction comes from him. Our strategy comes from him. Our instructions come from him. Who to talk to, who not to talk to, what to do when we're talking to someone. All that comes from him. So if you can't pray effectively because of the sinful lifestyle that you're in as a disciple, you're useless to him. And you are ineffective. You are not the salt of the earth. Does everyone see that? Yes. Okay. So let's con- let's continue. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Oh, okay. We just testing this thing out. We don't. All right. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you clearly. All right, so we're going to stay in the New King James Version and stay in Isaiah. And we're going to read a pretty lengthy passage that further highlights uh, the, this, this principle that we're looking at here. So in the New King James Version, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 1 through 4. And then we're going to jump down and read verses 9 through 20. So starting in verse verses one through four in Isaiah chapter one in the New King James Version, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amaz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. The wickedness of Judah, starting in verse two, hear, O heavens. And give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Alas, Sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. All right, hold on. I need you to scroll back up. Children who are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. So what we see here in verses 1 through 4 is God's chosen nation, God's chosen people, who he says that his children, who he brought up, who's he, who he's nurtured, they have turned away from them. As a nation, they are operating in sin. They are people laden, which means heavy loaded with iniquity. Cause them a brood of evildoers. They have turned away backward. They have turned their back to the Lord. This is the state of the children of Israel at this point in time in history. Right? Why is this important? Because we see, once again, that they, they are the people who should be operating in the word of God. They have a relationship with the Lord. They've been brought up in understanding righteousness and holiness. They know the law of God. But they are in a fallen, backslidden, iniquity state. All right, now let's jump to verses 9 through 20. Unless the Lord of hosts 
had left to us a very small remnant. So a small part of the, of the nation of Israel is we're going to be obedient to the Lord no matter what everybody else is doing. We're going to listen to his commandments. We're still going to be effectively praying. We're still going to be sacrificing the way that we should. We are not going after uh, strange gods and strange women and, and marrying our sons and daughters off to these uh, these carnal nations. We the, the small remnant within the nation of Israel, which is protected by the Lord of hosts, if it had not been for them, because of their relationship, because of their prayers, because of their sacrifices, we, the children of Israel, as a nation, would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah, meaning the Lord would have destroyed them. Hear the word of the Lord, You're, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. So this is addressed, so everybody stays on the same page, to the children of Israel. But Isaiah is making a connection that you are living as those who were in Sodom and Gomorrah. So I'm going to reference you as that. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to me, when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. This is very important, especially as we talk about us as disciples in the modern day church. What we are seeing the children of Israel operate in is they are not living for the Lord. They are operating in iniquity, but they're still trying to do all of the traditional church things. All of the sacrifices they're trying to do the same way. All of we still going to do the Sabbath celebration. We're still going to do the new moon festival. We're still going to go and make our sacrifices in the temple. We're still going to get together for the Sabbath. But you're not living out the word. That is very important as disciples in today's modern church. Because that's exactly what's going on now. Is we have a church of tradition. We have a church of performance. We have a church of... Of we want to signal to the Lord through laser shows, smoke, great worship and praise teams, but no one is living according to his word. So, so the Lord is frustrated. He's over it. And he, comm- he tells to the children of Israel, bro, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. They don't go together. You cannot continue to try to blend this two, these two. I do not care for any of this. I do not take pleasure in this. Verse 14, your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am wary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They are, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So really quick going back up. To verse, uh, I believe it's 14. 
no, verse 15. When you spread out your hands, as in to make a request, as in to make petition, as to sacrifice, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. So similarly, as disciples, we cannot find ourselves in this position. We cannot do what the Lord has ordained us to do as disciples if, we, if, he, if he's ignoring us. If he's not listening to us, if he's not picking up the phone call, there's nothing you can do, right? It's the same thing if you are networking, right? Because everyone tries to make it you know, seem like they have all the connections in the world. But if you can't call the person and say, hey, I need you to do this for me, your network is worthless, right? If you call me up and you say, Donovan, I, I, really, need, I really need a favor. I know you know... Uh, Rodeja. Can you call Rodeja? If Rodeja ignoring my phone calls, I can't help you. <laughs> that connection is worthless. It's the same way as disciples. If someone comes to us and says, like, I really need prayer from you, it, and you're not in a position to be able to intercede, you're not in a, be, in a position to be able to get a prayer through, you're not in a position to hear direction from the Lord, you are worthless as a disciple. Thoughts, comments, questions there before we go to the next verse. So, let's turn to, okay, hold on. Hmm. Right. My scriptures are frozen, so just hold on, let me pull up a new tab. So now let's go to, let me see, let's go to second, we're going to say in the New King James Version, let's go to second Chronicles chapter seven, verse 14. So staying in the New King James Version, we are going to second Chronicles chapter seven, verse 14. If my people who are called by, not, by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So this is the step towards correction. So as a disciple, if you find yourself operating iniquity, find yourself operating in sin, the way in which you then reestablish your connection, it starts with humility and it starts with asking for forgiveness and repentance. You have to turn away. You have to deny yourself. You have to ask the Lord for forgiveness. At that point, then your position is restored. Your, your ability to communicate because the Lord has already revealed, I don't hear you. When you, are, when you are in this state, your prayers, your intercessions, they are going to be ignored. They will not be acknowledged. All right, so let's go to then, we're going to stay in the New King James Version. And we're going to Psalm 34, verse 17. So staying in the New King James Version, we are going to Psalm 34, verse 17. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. So now we're, we're transitioning to show, right, the benefits, what we have access to as disciples operating within righteousness. Being able to get a prayer through. The righteous cry out. That is, that is very specific in what the Lord is revealing here. He's not saying everyone. He is saying the righteous cry out 
and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all that their troubles. What does it mean to what does it mean to be righteous? It means that you are in right standing with the word of God. You are in right standing in relationship with him. That is that person who stands in that position when they cry out. The Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. We have to, as disciples, transitioning a little bit here, we have to make sure, right, that we know our prayer effectiveness is tied to our relationship with the Jesus, with Jesus and how we are operating within righteousness and holiness. In addition to that, as we begin to educate and build up new disciples, we have to make sure that they understand this because right now the way the world understands and interprets prayer is that everyone has access to Jesus. What we are seeing in scripture and what is beginning to reveal itself that that was never communicated in scripture. Jesus came that all would have access to repentance and remission of sin through his name. That is true. We all have access to the process of going through repentance, being baptized in water, full submergence, full submersion in the name of Jesus, and being filled with the Holy Spirit with the sign of speaking in tongues. We all, we all have access to that. But when it comes to intercessory prayer, when it comes to communicating with, a G, with Jesus, when it comes to making requests outside of repentance... Not everybody has access to that. And this is a fundamental flaw within today's Christianity in terms of teaching the truth of Jesus. Sinners don't even have access to prayers for forgiveness. You have to be a saint as a classification. So a person who has not been born again has not been born of water, full submersion, full submersion in Jesus' name, and not been born of the baptiz, baptized in the Holy Spirit with the sign of speaking in other tongues, does not have access to forgiveness. Why? Because they have not been baptized in the blood of Jesus. There's no blood to apply. So as disciples, we really, we really have to combat the false teaching that any and everyone can just cry out to the Lord. That any and everyone can get a prayer through. That any and everyone can intercede on the behalf of others. That is biblically untrue. And we're going to see more of that in scripture. So let's look at two more uh, before we transition fully into that. But I just want to start laying the groundwork. Because like I said, as disciples... We have to make sure that we are praying in, sincer praying in sincerity and truth, but also making sure that those we're teaching, that those we're building up into disciples, those that we're even sharing the gospel with, that they fully understand this. Because so many times out here, when, I, um, when we're, we're talking to someone, we're sharing the gospel like, oh, you know, I pray to the Lord. And it's just like, if you're not praying for repentance, if you're not praying for the Lord Put someone in my position so that I can get to know you, so that I can go through the prescribed way to actually have a relationship with you. Then prayers are falling on deaf ears. So let's go. To, we're going to stay in the New King James Version. Let's go to Psalm 66, verse 18 through 20. So in the New King James Version, we are going to read Psalm 66. Verses 18 through 20. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. How can the psalmist know this to be true? Because in verse 18, it tells them, if you don't have iniquity in your heart, the Lord will heal you. So verse 20, blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. We're going to continue to build on this principle because it is critical as disciples that we understand who 
has access and who does not have access because this is critical to having an intimate relationship with the Lord. You can't have a relationship with someone you can't speak to. Thoughts, questions, comments before I go to the next verse. So we're standing in the up. Oh, Trina, go ahead. I just want to say that was really significant when you say you can't have a relationship with someone you can't speak to because most of the people believe that they have access to speak to them. You're absolutely right. Um, and that's why I said that uh, with Tremiko's lesson, right? One of the things that has really been coming to me as she's been talking on like spiritual war- warfare. One of like the key strategies, and I don't know if Tremiko will, will get to this within her series, that is like fundamental is the deception that Satan has interwoven within what we consider the truth of God's word. And one of those things is making people think that everyone has access to Jesus and, and can have relationship with him in the sense that there's nothing you need to do, right? That there's no prescribed way, that there's not a pathway to relationship with him that everyone has access to. And that is there is a difference in that statement. But just like Trina said, everyone thinks that they can just pray. Everyone thinks that they can intercede. And I think I used this example the last time I talked is that's what you see on Facebook. People will blast messages. Hey, I'm going through X, Y, Z. All of those who can pray, please do. No, you need to be very tactical. If I'm sincerely in the need of prayer, I am texting people I know who have a relationship with him and can get a prayer through. Because everybody who's throwing up prayers, that some of them phone calls are getting declined. Charlene. I'm sorry, I was talking, the thing was off. Um, how does this translate to children? Um, bringing them up, teaching them to pray or whatever. Um, how to, uh, even if you're, I mean, just teaching them the things of God so that they're, I mean, they're not, uh, say, um, born again when you start teaching them necessarily, or, I mean, what are you saying? Yeah, so as it pertains to children, right, we, Scripture reveals that to us. It, it says for us to bring them up in the way that they should go. So it is explaining to them the truth of relationship, why it's important to be born again, why it's important to have prayer. This is how you pray. Because the honest is that you are bringing them up to become born again, to repent, be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Spirit. That is, that is the ultimate objective. The problem is... Is for people who have not been brought up like that as children and then they become adults and they start operating in things that is not the prescribed way outlined in scripture. So with children, it is our roles as parents. We intercede on behalf of them. We have the relationship that protects them. Our prayers cover them in the house. And then we educate them to the point to get them to then establish their relationship through the prescribed way outlined in scripture with Jesus and that they understand these principles, these foundational principles. Does that answer your question, Charlene? Uh, yeah, but do we explain that their, uh, are their prayers not being heard because they're not uh, born again yet or what? I would say yes, because I think one of the things that we talk about often in Gather is we try to sugarcoat things for kids that we then get them confused when it says like, okay, yeah, well, what I told you when you were three, that doesn't apply now that you're 13. Um, so I think we need to be very specific in what scripture reveals and show that, you know, mommy and daddy, we are born again. We have the relationship with Jesus. We will pray for you. We will intercede on your behalf of you until you get to the point in which you have been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, which one of the things we know that we talk about is the moment a child is under, understands what the gospel is to get them baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit because of these critical pieces. And then I would just... Uh, yes, go, go on. Nope, go ahead. 
No, I, go on. I think you're going down the same path I was going. Go on. So, I don't know but what I was going to throw in there is keep in mind, remember, because I think a lot of times we forget how young children can be to operate in spiritual activity. Um, again, as stated before in the War Book series, um, how young James Kowalia was when he started operating at high levels of witchcraft, he was like ruling his region at the age of four, where witches and warlocks that were 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20 were, were under his control, and he was four. So what that means is we got to stop babying our babies and say they're not ready yet. Get them ready. Yeah. You should be getting them ready by the time they can understand speech. That's when you need to be explaining who Jesus is, um, born again, all of this, all of that. Because if you can be four years old issuing out curses and, and dealing in magic, how much more can someone on God's side, very young, can do the same thing? And I think we tend to we tend to neglect the fact, or uh, I'm not using the right words. Or I can't think of the right word I want to say. But we tend to not um, we we tend tend to dumb down the reality of how young children can be to understand spiritual things and operate in spiritual things. So the point of what I'm trying to say is a child can be born again at five, six, seven. They don't have to be 10, 12 or whatever to be born again. And I, and I know to a small degree, we saw that in the children's ministry when I was there. Right. Uh, yeah, and I mean, those are good points. And But I'm, I'm thinking about t- uh, explaining this to a staff of adult people who have not really heard this before, um, that, um, you know, just how to, to word it to, uh, but you, uh, you went through pretty well, Donovan, that, uh, we're explaining to them that they are covered by their parents, which (laughs) they may not have parents that are saved either, but, um, uh, and that when they become, you know, when they get a chance to, um, be, when they're filled with the Holy Ghost, then their prayers will be, I would say their prayers will be heard by God. Um, I don't know, I'm just trying to get, because I have the responsibility for teaching the staff, and uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to say, well, they don't need me praying because God ain't going to hear you anyway. You know, that's not it. So, um, uh, how, I'm just wondering, how do you say it? I mean, I wouldn't say it like that, but it's, <laughs> it is to a point where we, we have to teach the truth of the process. Um, and I think to Tremiko's point, one of the things that we see when, when, when we are instructing children is we water down and remove things to make it digestible. But the, the truth of the matter is, as a classification, sinners... Do cannot have a prayer life because they don't have relationship. That that is the truth of the word. Now, how I would teach an adult to be able to communicate that with a child is walking through the process. Here's why being born again is so important because it gives you access to Jesus. How do I get access to Jesus? You have to be, you have to repent. You have to be born again of water, full submersion in Jesus name and filled with the Holy Spirit, with the sign of speaking in other tongues. And then this gives you access as right now that you are a child. You are under the authority and protection of your parents relationship and their prayers and their intercession on your behalf. Now, as you said, Charlene, if that child is not in that position, they are vulnerable. But then that where that's where we as the body in the community As you've done with Children's Church in general, we step in. So that goes back to what we were talking about, the disciples' effectiveness of their prayer. We are interceding, protecting, and praying over those those children who are under our stewardship. But in terms of teaching teachers to teach, you have to get them to understand this concept. Because like I said, this is not something that is taught. Yeah, that's why I, you gave me the wording. I just, I just was trying to put it together in my, in my head. No, I get you. Um, Adriana, I'm gonna get you next. I, Tremiko, to hop on your camera, so she got something to say. <laughs> well, yeah, we were 
Rhodesia was next. Let me just say this, and then Rhodesia go, and then it'll be Adriana. Um, what I was just going to add, the small thing I'll add that, because I think y'all kind of summarized where I was getting ready to go with that, but two things in my head was, one is, we should be training children to pray because you train them in the way that they should go. So although they're not in a position, right, where they can be moving and shaking, because if you look at how God had me flow when I was there, nobody that was not born again could be on spirit team and operate in that capacity to be praying for other people and doing stuff. Why? Because they were ineffective. They weren't born again. So we should be training them to pray because they're going to need to know how to do it Mm -hmm. once they do get born again. But then also, as Donovan said, and you were saying, what if the parents or they don't have anyone in the household praying for them? That is your responsibility as being spiritual leaders in children's ministry. Y'all should be covering those children every single day or whenever you're praying, getting up and saying your daily prayers. It should encompass encompass all of the children that are within that ministry so that someone at least is covering them in prayer. Um, yeah, so that's what we've been doing, but um, uh, uh, Donovan just added a few, a little bit extra to it. And so now I have more information to, um, you know, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's yeah you want nature. them as, as I said earlier, right. And Tremico referenced the scripture as well is train them up in the way they should, they should go. You want to instruct and teach them. This is how you pray. This is why you pray. But we, we have to, as a church, become more consistent in teaching the truth of God's word, no matter the age. So then when they get older, it's, we're, we're not, it's not like, okay, now you can switch from Disney Channel to a more mature channel. So, right, because it confuses you. Because, like, well, well, what I learned in children's church is not the same thing I'm learning in the young adult class. And you're so not building you up on not it. Have, can you not have uh, a children volunteer to pray for the class when it, you're opening because they're not safe? I would not do that. I would lean to what Tremiko just said in terms of actual spiritual activity, okay. right? Like the spirit okay. squad, uh, praying no, over I, the class. Yeah, yeah. That, that's totally out. Yeah. That, that was never an issue. But I'm saying, you know, uh, the teachers a lot of times would have children would say, can I pray? Can I pray? And they lead us and lead us in the Lord's Prayer or something like that. Um, is that is that to be shunned or, or what? I would say you can use that as an activity and as a practice. But in terms of if you're actually opening opening like how we do opening with prayer and praying over uh, the environment in the class that needs to be done by someone who has access to Jesus. Uh, yeah, but I, I meant that. So that, so, actual, like I said, as so, an act, activity it, and function, right? So, like, it. hey, today we are going to practice what we learned about prayer. Who wants to stand up and walk us through that? Okay, totally fine, right? That's that's training. But if I'm saying, hey, we are about to usher in and start this class, let's pray over the equipment, let's pray over the atmosphere, let's pray to make sure that the presence is someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized in Jesus' name and yeah. living a right... Usually the, yeah. And usually the teacher would do that. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to... I have actually, like, multiple questions now, uh, but I'm going to start with, like, the relation to this specific topic of children and parents. So say, like, for our household... Um, we are raising AJ. We're going to teach him how to pray and everything. We're going to give him the scriptures and the information about how, since he is, uh, like up until the point he gets water baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, since you are not baptized with the Holy Spirit, you know, scripture says that the Lord is like, he's not hearing you. However, you still need to learn. And when you're ready, then you will have the power and the Lord will, he will, will open his ears to you. And this should not be a concerning thing because since we know that children can operate at such a young age, this should be happening around like three, four, maybe five years old when he comes to a full understanding. So it shouldn't, like, it's not a problem because he's going to be so young when he comes into the, power to be able to like be heard by the Lord properly correct correct okay another question now um 
when it comes to like people, adults just willy nilly out in the world, um, a lot of times we'll see like they might pray for something small. Say like, okay, I want, I'm gonna just make this up. Praying for a lunch. This is somebody who is not filled, not baptized, whatever, and not like they'll pray for certain things and then it'll happen. Now, is that due to grace on the Lord's behalf? Satan trying to just keep them where they at because if they stay com- content, they're not going to change their ways. A mixture of both, somebody else interceding. Like, how is that explained then? People are like, well, I've been praying, I get my answer, my prayers answered, whatever, on like certain things in their life. It could be a number of things. It could be through the protection of intercession of folks who are in their family, like you just mentioned. Um, it could be a trap, right? We know Satan gives people rewards and promotions to keep them in thinking that they're, especially now that we subscribe uh, prosperity to righteousness, that's an easy trap that Satan uses. And in addition, scripture shows us that Jesus uses his kindness and good gifts to draw us to repentance. So it, it could be a mix of things. I couldn't write without giving getting specific direction from Jesus on that specific situation. I couldn't tell you like, yes, this is A, yes, that is B. But what we're, what we're talking about and what we have to get aligned to is the big picture. What is the prescribed way outlined by Jesus? Not the exceptions to the rule that we don't have contacts on. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I was just thinking of like having that conversation with someone. I can see that being an argument of, oh, well, I've been doing this my whole life and I ain't doing that. And I still get my my prayers answered and being able to be like, you know, give like, well, there could be these situations. However, the prescribed way is this scripturally so, and then if you disagree, you know, go ahead, walk away, bye. Yeah, and then it's also having a conversation, but what does your overall life look like, right? Not, you know what I'm saying, you get free lunch every single day, but are you in the position that you want to be in? This is more than just uh, from a, a prosperous standpoint of, you know, whether you're homeless or not, but your, your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, your relationships, your jobs, the delays and attacks that you're dealing with. That, that's when you kind of start digging deeper, right? And getting past the surface level of, you know, yeah, my prayers get answered. Okay, but your life is in shambles. So, they, so obviously, either your prayer life ain't as effective as you thought it was, or you ain't praying for the right things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. No problems. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Adriana. Hello, everyone. I was just gonna uh, answer a lot of things. Uh, I got some questions. Uh, well, I was just gonna say, um, a lot of people, like as parents, we think that our children don't understand that. A lot of things they understand beyond their years, um, and we need to start teaching them when they're infants. When Cohen was three months, just from my personal experience, we started teaching Cohen how to pray because he was able to say certain words at three months. And when you say, Cohen, let's pray, he would put his hands in a prayer position and start saying Jesus. So they they understand a whole lot more. Like, I, I don't know, I think just us as parents, we think that everything needs to be broken down and, and baby fed. They understand a whole lot. And I honestly believe that they come from a spiritual place already and they're developing um, to become these children and young adults and things of that nature where other things happen as they grow into their little bodies and their minds where they're far ahead of themselves when they first come. So if we start training them early on, they will develop and grow. And I think that was just what I wanted to say. And then my question is, um, I, I was always taught when I was younger that God is always with the innocent, my soul children. And my experience growing up where I didn't really have, like, my mom probably was doing things and living in sin. So even though she prayed, maybe her prayers wasn't really being heard or being answered. I felt like God was with me all throughout my life. Like, he answered all my prayers. He is the one who saved my life because I probably would have ended my life if it it wasn't for God. 
um, coming to talk to me, allowing me to talk to him about my day and all my frustrations of my day. And he was the one who was teaching me about the Bible, that I'm not supposed to seek revenge, that I need to read, learn to read his word because his word is the only sword that um and and that's the only thing that can defeat the enemy like i learned all this stuff with god <laughs> so i guess my question is is it possible for god to be with good ch- with children and and um protect them from certain things and the child be able to communicate to God without being baptized. And then my next question would be in regards to Cohen, because he was baptized. What does that mean for him? Got it. Um, So the Lord can speak to and direct to, to whoever he wants. Right. So in terms of how he interacts with us is not the same in which way we interact with him. So there are numerous folks who have testimonies, especially like if you uh, watch YouTube, a lot of Christians who live in Muslim countries of how that they were directed by the spirit of the Lord to move differently. Right. To go seek this person out, to go read this information that the Lord touch their heart, which scripture says, when you hear the voice of the Lord, harden not your heart. What that is coming from is a person of peace, a person whose heart is in a position to repent, to turn away, which is what scripture says that we we have, everyone has access to that process to be able to be like, Lord, I have heard you. What must I do to be saved? Everyone has access to that child or adult sinner because that's the only way you're going to get at, get into the process that initial position of I'm in a repentant state and Lord I want to be saved right what what I am talking now is once you move past that into building relationship with him being able to intercede being able to war and command satan to go to have authority over demonic spirits to be able to cast out to be able to heal you cannot do that without being born again you can't and that is what scripture reveals and the process of that is you have to be you have to have repented Been water baptized in the name of Jesus because that gives you access to the blood. That gives you access to repentance and remission of sin and filled with the Holy Spirit with the sign of speaking in other tongues because that is where the power and authority lies. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Trimigo, you want to add anything to that or are we good? Sounds good. Just know, too, that um, I just want to make sure everybody understands the water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As Donovan said, I just want to point it out. It accomplishes two different things. Water baptism washes away your sins, remits. Water baptism does not give you power to battle with Satan, to be able to war and intercede for other people. The power of the Holy Spirit does that, which is why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is important, and you'll know exactly who you're trying to speak in the tongues. So I just want to make sure we know those two baptisms are accomplishing two different things. Um, so I just want to throw that out there, and that's it. Yeah. And so two examples that we can see kind of this layout, right? So if we look at Acts, we can look at Paul's experience, right? When he was on the Damascus Road, Jesus called out to him. Why? Because Paul, contrary to what is taught, thought he was doing the right thing by persecuting Christians. He thought that they truly were operating in false doctrine and blaspheming against Jehovah, God the Father, what he what he understood. Jesus reached out to it, it is me who you persecute. And he asked, Well, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, who they crucified. Ah, got it. Revelation. I need to go get baptized. I need to go get filled with the Holy Spirit. We can see the same thing with Cornelius in his camp. 
they were living in terms of making sacrifices to the Lord as they knew from the Old Testament, what they understood from the children of, from the nation of Israel. They wanted a relationship. They were seeking a relationship. The Lord responded to them because their heart was in the position. They were people of peace. You need to send for Peter. He then goes to Peter. You need to go do X, Y, and Z. They then get baptized in Jesus name. And then they get, well, no, they get filled with the Holy Spirit first. And then they get baptized. So we see these examples of scripture where that initial is your heart. Once you hear the voice of the Lord, heart, not your heart. That process, that is Jesus to us. We, he has seen our heart. He has seen the position that, oh, you are ready to repent. You truly want to be saved. I'm going to move heaven and earth. I'm going to get my disciples who are operating in the earth in position to come get you. That is not the same as to what Tremiko just said in terms of operating in spiritual warfare, operating in spiritual authority. A sinner cannot do that. And then two, the Lord just threw this in my conscience. Um, so to, to, to also go to the question you asked Adriana about when you were a kid, because I know you had certain spiritual experiences with God, but you weren't yet born again. Going back to what Donovan was saying, when it relates to things about knowing God so that you can get to this place of receiving him and being born again, yes, God will have that communication. So if a child wants to talk to God in prayer all day long to get to know him, to ask questions, things like that, he's not going to ignore them. He's going to answer that. There's a guy who actually lives here in Dearborn, Michigan. He's been Muslim his whole life. And he reflects, he's now born again, but he reflected when he was younger, how Jesus appeared to him. And he was not trying to worship Jesus. He was worshiping Allah. And Jesus was, was appearing to him and talking to him. Similar to how you had experiences, Adriana, where you talked to Jesus, you saw him, you were having these spiritual experiences. Why? Because God was trying to get to this, this boy who now became a man to let him know, I am the true God. Allah is not the true God. And so eventually he has these life experiences where he, you know, push, pushes that experience to the side. He doesn't want to share it with anyone in his family because, of course, you can get murdered or ridiculed as a Muslim. And then later he has these experiences where he has another encounter with Jesus Christ and he has a whole testimony and now he's born again. But it wasn't like God was not going to talk to him because God's his will is for all people to come to repentance and to be saved. So he's going to reach out to people who aren't born again and try to have those discussions, just like Donovan gave the examples of Paul and Cornelius and things like that. But that doesn't mean that that Muslim, that doesn't mean that Cornelius and all these other people could start interceding for other people and doing warfare and opening up a service to usher in the presence of God. No. But if a sinner, if a child wants to talk to God because they want, they're really seeking truth, they really want to get to know him, he will respond to that. So just wanted to throw in another example. Yep. Adriana. Thank you both. I, and you just said it, Miko. I was going to say, yeah, I was one of those children who was seeking him. I knew that he was true, and I knew that he was the only one who could save me, and I have been taught different parts of or pieces of the Bible, and I, I would question God, like, God, if your word says this, then why is this? Well, uh, well if your word says that, how, how is this? I would ask him questions, and I'm like, in my heart, I knew he was the only one who can answer it. And when I start, it's almost like he, he just understood me, like when I explained certain things that was taking place in my life and how it was making me feel, he was the one who told me that I would be able to come to heaven and I could only stand at the gate of heaven, and I was able to talk to him about my day every night. And he would give me advice uh, on how to handle certain things and how I'm supposed to respond. And that's how, like, the people in my family, like, they're real temperamentic. And I, that's how I was, I, I've always had a very calmness about me, even in the midst of mess, because God always told me, like, don't be quick to anger. Don't be quick to react. Listen, like, and that's how I have, and my family would get angry with me for being so calm in the midst of madness. And, but that came from God. It was his teaching. 
Absolutely. And so that's what, so I'll reiterate uh, just to be clear. So that's why I, I started with talking about the effectiveness of, effectiveness of discipleship because when it comes to relationship and getting to the know the Lord to get access to repentance, like I said earlier, it is his desire that all men be saved. That is accessible to everyone. But because of his prescribed way in terms of how we get for free, forgiveness for sin, it's through the baptism of Jesus name. Right. I got to get you to that point. I got to get you to the right process. OK, how then can I start begin to operate and defend myself both against Satan's attacks and be effective disciple? I got to get you filled with the Holy Spirit, with the sign of speaking in other tongues. That is the access that we move past. Be as we as we say in Scripture, uh, as we see in scripture beyond the veil, right? The tearing of the veil to get into the holies of holies to get access to him. There is a prescribed way that we as disciples have to be more vocal in teaching folks so that they understand. And right now, the prevailing thought in the world is the access we're talking about in spiritual authority, the effectiveness of interceding on the behalf of others and your, yourselves is accessible to everyone. That is not. R repentance, remission of sin, and seeking truth, that is accessible to everyone. That is how we all eventually get to the point that we are right now being born again, is we became the person of peace. Our hearts softened towards the Lord, and we want to know you, God, and we want to know what we must do to be saved. But we have to, when it starts with the children and growing up, when it starts with adults who are babes in Christ and building in disciples, we really have to delineate the separation when it comes to prayer and communication, communicating with the Lord. And it's we do this with everything, right? You, there are things you can only access as an adult once you turn 18. Before you turn 18 in, in the U.S., you cannot vote. But in school, you go to through a government class, you go through history, um, you may go through civics, you go through all this preparation for something that you cannot do until you turn 18. And it's the same thing when you think about driving, right? You, you got to go take a test to get a permit. We got to test you to even see if you are, if you can practice on the world, on the road. Once you pass that test, you are given your permit so you can actually have more in life experience in training and being on the road, you, you still can't drive without adult supervision, without a licensed person being in the car. But once you're then ready to take your driver's test and you pass that, then you are given a license. So we really have to be like when we talk about those things, no one gets upset. And they're like, well, what about the children who want to vote? No, you don't know enough. You can't vote in this country till you're 18. We can train you up to understand, right, the three branches of government, what Congress does, what the executive branch does, what the judicial branch does. We do all of this educating and training. And then once you're 18, you can utilize it. We as disciples, we, we have to get back to teaching and not being teaching that there is a difference between praying to know God, praying to get access to repentance, praying for the Lord to send someone so that you can know him is different than operating in spiritual warfare and spiritual authority. Those two things are different. It doesn't mean that Jesus loves you any less. He just has a prescribed way of doing things. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, that's really good. Yes. Okay, so we are at 1230. I got to remember that y'all are an hour ahead of me because I was about to keep going. <laughs> um, so we will pick up with the new material next week. And we're going to look in more detail when we're talking about classifications. Remember now, as we started, when we were talking about discipleship as a framework, one of the things that we examined and spent time on was showing the biblical classification of a saint and a sinner. And how those two classifications are the only ones that exist. You are either a saint, meaning you have repented, been born again, uh, baptized in water, full submerged in Jesus' name, and filled with the Holy Spirit, the sign of speaking in tongues. It doesn't mean that you then never sin again, that you never then need to ask for forgiveness. 
It is a classification. And if you are, if you have not done those things, you are classified as a sinner. It doesn't matter if you uh, donate money to your local boys and girls club, if you're a nice person, if you're kind hearted, all that's good and well in terms of personality traits. But if you have not been born again of water and spirit, you are classified as a sinner. So we're going to look at that as it pertains to prayer, sort of what we touched on today, but we're going to get deeper into scriptural revelation on that. So any last minute thoughts, comments, or questions? All right. Lord, we just thank you for the great questions and discussions that we had, we had today. Lord, we thank you for the, the continued knowledge that you give us through these discussions so that we can be more effective disciples. We can be more um, effective teachers, Lord, and that we continue to build our relationship with you both, being humble that you have called us um, to represent you, O oh Lord, but also humble enough uh, to know that that is not the only thing um, that we, there's so much more that we can do. There's so much more that we can learn that we will never arrive, but that we can continue to grow in you. I pray right now that everyone under the sound of my voice, that they would enjoy their Sunday, that they would enjoy the rest of their weekend, that we all would get some rest to start our week afresh um, with new energy, new strength, renewed in the name of Jesus, I pray against any attacks that would come for the world, word's sake, any tribulation or affliction. I cancel and rebuke right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.